welcome all of you. Good afternoon. My name is Joseph Kearney, and it is a great privilege for me as Dean of Marquette University Law School to welcome you to our annual Bowdoin Lecture. Let me begin with a word or two concerning the individual in whose memory this lecture stands, Robert F. Bowden, a Marquette lawyer from our class of 1952, who served as dean of the law school from 1965 until his untimely death in 1984. I have come to know a bit about him from a number of you, for whom Dean Bowden variously was a professor, a colleague on the faculty, or a fellow member of the Wisconsin legal community. To this day, I hold him up to our students as an example of the law as a learned profession. We have sought to remember Dean Bowden in a number of ways. In Sensenbrenner Hall, we had the Bowden courtroom. Here in Eckstein Hall, on the third floor, we have the Bowden suite housing our law journals. And in both places, we have had, for the better part of two decades now, this annual lecture. Through it, we bring to the Marquette Law School community, including the practicing bar of Milwaukee, a distinguished academic from another university. And how fortunate we are this year to have with us Robert E. Scott, the Alfred McCormick Professor of Law at Columbia University. Before joining the Columbia faculty, Professor Scott served on the faculty of the University of Virginia School of Law for some 30 years, most of that as the school's Lewis F. Powell, Jr. professor. In fact, much of it was as the school's dean. Dean Scott led the UVA Law School for 10 years, rendering extraordinary service not just on capital campaign and building fronts, but also in terms of the school's substantive academic work and receiving great acclaim both domestically and abroad, that is, both at the university and in the National Legal Academy. Throughout all of his ongoing career, Bob Scott has been a leading national scholar in the area of contracts. Indeed, among his academic appointments at Columbia is as director of the Center on Contract and Economic Organization. For his lecture today, Professor Scott has chosen contract design and the Goldilocks problem. So please join me in welcoming to Marquette University Law School in Milwaukee, this year's Bowdoin Lecture, Professor Robert E. Scott. Thanks, Joe. I thank uh, uh, Dean Kearney for that introduction. Uh, I must say it's a delight to be in this beautiful Exneen Hall. Uh, it puts our more humble uh, surroundings on Morningside Heights in New York to shame. And I especially want to thank all of you for coming. I suspect that more than a few of you uh, would rather be on the road to Lambeau Field right now. <laughs> but here we all are together. So I teach and write about contracts, and I've done so for 40 years. During that time, my approach has changed considerably. I used to teach contracts uh, the traditional way. We would read cases of prior contract disputes, and then analyzing them from a litigator's perspective, help the students reconstruct the arguments. So ultimately, I would ask, what is the argument that would have given the plaintiff or the defendant the best chance of prevailing in court? Now, that's a worthy exercise. It forces the students to learn the difference between good arguments and silly ones. And it is an essential skill of any good lawyer. Moreover, it is likely to be helpful to those who end up as commercial litigators. But there is one problem. Data show that most practicing lawyers working in commercial and corporate practice are transactional lawyers, not litigators. And so over time, my perspective has shifted. And now, I do continue to have students read cases, but I now spend much more of my time with the students asking a much different question. How could we have designed this contract to have prevented the dispute from arising in the first place? This is the perspective of the transactional lawyer looking at cases from the viewpoint of a pathologist. 
Why did the patient die? Sometimes, of course, the answer is that a contract dispute like death is inevitable. But much more often, it turns out that a well-designed contract could have greatly minimized the risk of litigation. Now, nowhere is this issue of contract design more relevant than today in the current debate over contract interpretation. Contract interpretation remains the single most important source of commercial litigation and the least settled, most contentious area of contemporary contract doctrine and scholarship. Framed by the battle between the titans of contract, Samuel Willison and Arthur Corbin, continuing to the present day, two opposing positions have competed for dominance in contract interpretation. Many, indeed, most states are like Wisconsin. They follow a traditional common law textualist approach to interpretation. Here, when the writing is clear, courts cannot choose to consider the context surrounding the contract. In contrast, in states that follow California, and in all states where the subject matter involves the sale of goods under the Uniform Commercial Code, courts are contextualist. Here, courts must consider context, regardless of the clarity of the written agreement. Thus, the battle is joined, text versus context. This battle over contract interpretation, which is better, text or context, illustrates a deep chasm that separates these scholarly debates over contract doctrine from the real world of contract design. The contract doctrine purports to address a single question. What should courts do? Should a court adopt a hard or a soft parole evidence rule? Does the common law plain meaning rule continue to apply? Are merger clauses conclusive evidence that the writing is integrated? But the design choices that lawyers make for their commercial clients are motivated by quite different considerations. Transactional lawyers who design contracts for sophisticated parties are much more concerned with managing the role of a court in resolving contract disputes than they are over styles of contract interpretation. And designing a contract that successfully manages the court's role is not an easy task. The fundamental challenge lawyers face in designing a contract is that contractual obligations are agreed to ex ante at the time the contract is formed, but are enforced ex post after the transaction is broken down and the parties are litigating. Now, because courts have the benefit of hindsight, the ex post world sometimes, though not always, resolves the uncertainties of ex ante contracting. In order to resolve those uncertainties, however, courts must be empowered to interpret contract terms. Now, here's the rub. The invitation to interpret the contract inevitably creates the opportunity for a do-over, a mulligan, where either party can behave strategically. The party who is disappointed by subsequent events may now argue that the contract as written doesn't really fully reflect the party's true agreement. And conversely, the party who was blessed by fate may argue that the contract as written is exactly what the parties intended, even though it appears in hindsight to lead to completely unreasonable results. Anticipating this problem, the challenge for the transactional lawyer is to choose between two very different options, either to expend costs in negotiating and drafting in order to devise innovative contract terms that reduce the likelihood of future strategic behavior, or postpone those costs and delegate discretion to a court to later root out 
and deter the strategic behavior once litigation arises. Now, there are several reasons why contract doctrine doesn't provide any guidance on how best to respond to this challenge. But one in particular stands out. Contract law scholars have failed badly in understanding the causes and effects of contract breach. The difficulty starts with a misspecification of the problem. It is simply incorrect to think of contract breach as being either an action or an inaction by a party who thereby fails to perform her contractual obligations satisfactorily. More properly, breach is a legal conclusion reached by a court that is charged with the duty of resolving these private disputes. So let's ask the question more precisely. Given the coercive power of the state to enforce contracts and then to award compensatory damages, why do parties ever breach? There are three major explanations. First, many breaches are inadvertent. That is, parties breach because they are unable simply to provide a timely and conforming performance. Now, for our purposes, it doesn't matter why. It could be failures in production or supply or any other host of external shocks that prevent full and complete performance of the contract. In any event, inadvertent breach does not implicate contract design, at least not directly. But what about advertent or purposive breaches? Here, there are two candidates. One hypothesis, very popular among contract scholars, can be traced rather directly to an article that Charles Goetz and I wrote 35 years ago. Developing an idea first suggested by Robert Birmingham, we coined the phrase efficient breach. Efficient breach theory was based on the premise that a contractual obligation is not necessarily an obligation to perform, but rather is an obligation to choose between performance or the payment of compensatory damages. Getz and I explained the standard default rule of expectation damages by hypothesizing, and I quote, that breach occurs where the breaching party anticipates that paying compensation and allocating his resources to alternative uses will make him better off than performing his obligation, unquote. Well, you will forgive false modesty. It was a nice try, but as a matter of fact, uh, it doesn't fit the data. There are very few examples of an efficient breach in which one party chooses between performance and the payment of expectation damages that are subsequently assessed by a court. In truth, efficient breach is both a null set and an oxymoron. So while we meant well, uh, Getz and I are probably primarily responsible for leading a generation of scholars down the wrong garden path. Does this mean that the data show that there is no such thing as an advertent breach in the sense of a conscious breaking of a promise to perform? Not at all. There are literally hundreds of cases where parties have been found by a court to have consciously breached their obligations under the contract. The interesting thing about these cases, however, is that breach is not the result of a rational choice between the alternatives of a performance that costs more than it is worth or paying equally costly compensatory damages. Rather, it is a conclusion by a court following a trial in which both parties insisted that their behavior was entirely proper under the contract. So what's going on here? But one possibility is that one of these parties, let's call him the doofus, is simply miscalculating what kind of performance the contract requires. But a second, much more likely possibility is that one of the parties is welching on the deal. 
Now, we might be tempted to label this latter behavior as opportunism. Indeed, a number of scholars have recently argued that this risk of opportunistic breach is sufficiently acute that courts should zealously police against opportunism by deploying their traditional equity powers to punish an opportunistic party, even in the face of a completely integrated and unambiguously written contract. They contend that this heightened risk of opportunism undermines any argument that sophisticated parties are themselves better equipped to deal with this risk through rational contract design. Well, in defense of the view that reliance on contract design is, in fact, the better approach, I am going to argue today that what the proponents of a return to traditional equity claim can be done in theory, generalist courts, in fact, cannot do, at least not reliably. So let's begin with the concept of opportunism. Oliver Williamson famously defined opportunism as self-interest with guile. But that characterization isn't quite right here. As it appears initially to the court, both of these parties are guileless. Thus, we need to sort the behavior of the honest but mistaken breacher from behavior that is self-interested but appears to be guileless. So let's call this second behavior that I am describing shading, as in shading the truth. My hypothesis is that the courts face a fundamental dilemma. First, that shading behavior is ubiquitous. And second, that it is nearly impossible for a court to sort out who is the doofus and who is the shader. Now let me take a moment to try to defend both of these propositions. To begin, why is it that shading is so pervasive? There are several reasons, but the most important is the fundamental fact that all contracts even those carefully drafted in every detail, must be interpreted. Even if the interpretation is by a textualist court that relies on the common law parole evidence rule to limit its inquiry to the text of the agreement and its plain language, the court is still required to make coherent a contract with over 100 individual provisions each of which may be unambiguous when viewed in isolation, but subject to interpretation when taken together. This means that all contracts require courts to implement correctly the ex-ante instructions that the parties have embedded in their agreement. Now, these instructions can either be framed as what we can call hard terms, precise, bright-line rules, such as, for example, the widgets must have a tolerance of one one-hundredths of an inch. Or they can be framed as soft terms, broad general standards, such as the widgets must be of mercantile quality. But whether hard or soft, here's the dilemma. One party or the other will obtain a substantial advantage whenever there is a sub a, a substantial or significant exogenous shock. So, for example, if the terms are hard, the party with the apparent benefit of this bright line rule can extort rents by refusing to adjust in ways that would reduce the ex post losses of his counterparty. Let's call that type one shading. Shifting advantage to the counterparty by substituting a soft standard in place of the bright line rule merely creates a moral hazard risk on the other side, inviting a losing party to exploit the court's discretion by persuading it to reallocate losses that were in fact allocated to that party by the contract. That's type two shading. Second, Shading is not only pervasive, 
but it is also extraordinarily difficult to detect. And that is because the shader is often entirely sincere in her belief that she has complied with the contract and that it is the counterparty that's the breacher. Now here there is a phenomenon that every good commercial lawyer here well understands. The behavioral reality is simply this, that agreeing before the fact to bear a low probability, long tail risk is quite a different matter from being willing to absorb the entire cost once that risk materializes. The prospect of suffering large ex post losses can produce a form of cognitive amnesia in which both parties are convinced that their behavior is entirely consistent with their contractual obligations. So what is the court supposed to do? As I mentioned earlier, several scholars have recently argued for this return to traditional equity. On their view, courts should make a Solomonic determination of who is the likely opportunistic party, make their call, and then impose sanctions independently of what the contract appears to require. But before we endorse that approach, we must first answer a key empirical question. Can generalist courts find the shaders among the doofuses? To begin to answer that question, I've assembled a data set of 75 randomly selected contract disputes where the issue before the court in each case was who breached the contract. And I tested two hypotheses. First, that disputes in which a party could plausibly be guilty of either type 1 or type 2 shading are very common. Second, that courts in such cases would not or could not reliably identify behavior as opportunistic. Now, the tentative findings are consistent with both hypotheses. 46 of these selected cases involved claims that the counterparty's behavior could plausibly have constituted either type 1 or type 2 shading. And in 19 of these 46 cases, at least one party alleged, either in the pleadings or in the briefs, that their counterparty's claims were opportunistic. Yet in none of the 19 cases alleging opportunism did the court either explicitly or by inference identify this behavior as opportunistic behavior. To be sure these results are only suggestive, these courts could be resolving the doofus shader decision sub rosa, but merely declined to identify it explicitly. But I think we would agree that at best, the judicial silence gives us very little confidence that courts can do what many scholars are asking them to do. Now there's other data that supports the hypothesis that generalist courts are poor candidates for using their equity powers to root out opportunism. In order to identify and penalize opportunism, the court obviously has got to be able to measure this party's behavior against the customs and usages of the relevant trading community. But recent research has shown that ongoing dealings never crystallize into well-defined customary usages of trade at all. This evidence suggests that many courts, when asked to identify a trade usage, rely instead on interested party testimony. For example, they might have the plaintiff's warehouse manager testify that well shipments do usually arrive in three days, rather than on a careful evaluation of complex evidentiary submissions. In short, there is virtually no evidence that courts undertake the empirical investigations needed to find a relevant custom and then use it to identify opportunistic behavior, and even less reason to imagine they could succeed if they did. 
Here then is the dilemma. Enforcing contracts requires interpretation, which means courts are asked to police shading behavior, but doing so often leads to errors because the courts are asked to do more than they are able to do. And let's call this the Goldilocks problem. Left to their own devices, courts will either intervene too much or too little. So what is the alternative? How do we get just the right amount of judicial policing of contracts? My argument is that sophisticated contracting parties and their lawyers can, and in fact they do, design their contracts in ways that invite a court to perform this policing function only when the court is likely to get the question right. But before we look at the ways transactional lawyers can accomplish this task, we should take a moment and remember that the problem was not always this severe. At early common law, the Goldilocks problem was contained by virtue of the historic division of roles between law and equity. Historically, the English common law applied two different sets of doctrines to interpret a disputed contract. The first consisted of common law rules decided in common law courts, such as the parole evidence rule, the plain meaning rule, and the like. They were cast in objective terms that minimized the need for any subjective judgment in their application. And as you will remember, they were administered strictly without exceptions for cases in which the application of the rule appeared to defeat its purpose. The second set of doctrines consisted largely of equitable principles originating in the English Court of Chancery, which began to exercise overlapping jurisdiction with the common law courts to hear those cases that in the ordinary course of the law failed to provide justice. Now, the Chancery's willingness to provide an independent and alternative forum stemmed from the perception that the common law courts were incapable of policing opportunism because of their strict rule-bound inclination to apply the law rigorously without reference to the context at hand. The Chancery's sole focus, in contrast, was with the equities of the case at bar. And indeed, you'll remember that for many years, the Chancery's rulings no precedential effect, which freed the Chancery from any concern that its rulings could undermine the consistency and predictability of contracting. And important for our purposes, there was one key additional fact. In pre-industrial England, the Chancery was much more intimately familiar with the contextual environment of typical party disputes and could fairly sort relevant from irrelevant facts. Fundamentally, as we know, however, the institutions of the common law and the Chancery were at cross purposes. The result was two competing systems, often with incompatible procedural and substantive doctrines, yet overlapping in jurisdiction. The ultimate result of the merger of law and equity meant that the institutional framework of the state could no longer by itself solve the Goldilocks problem. In contrast to the early courts of equity, when the courts were close to the actors in a largely homogeneous economy, generalist courts today are removed from the enormously varied commercial environment and therefore are relatively ineffective <coughs> in uncovering the underlying context. So let's abandon the question the commercial litigator might ask. What contract doctrines, they would say, help courts determine when to intervene? Rather now, let's ask the question from the transactional perspective. How can we design a contract that limits the risk of opportunism and thus combines the court's role 
in supervising the contracting process. And I'm recovering from a cold, and I apologize if I am stumbling along the way. We now return, finally, to the question with which we began. How do skilled transactional lawyers, the contract designers of this world, address the Goldilocks problem? Is it possible to design such a contract? Well, studies of contemporary commercial practices that my colleagues uh, Ron Gilson and Chuck Sable and I have undertaken over the last four years suggest the answer is yes. Commercial parties today are doing something different. And what they are doing is an effort to solve the Goldilocks problem in novel ways. Now, the starting point for understanding what's going on today is to focus on two critical characteristics of the contracting environment. The first is the level of uncertainty. Are commercial practices stable and predictable? Or are they disrupted by unforeseen changes in technical possibilities and market conditions? That's the uncertainty continuum. All else equal, the higher the level of uncertainty, the more difficult it is for parties to write and courts to interpret completely specified and fully integrated contracts. The second characteristic is the scale or thickness of the market. So the question here is whether there are many traders or, or only a few engaged in a particular class of transaction using similar contracting strategies. Again, all else equal, the greater the number of traders engaged in a transaction, the more likely that the contract terms and the rules for their interpretation will be provided by a collective entity, such as a trade association, that can then provide to the court the necessary context for interpretation. So the interplay of these two forces, uncertainty and scale, points to the new forms of contracting among sophisticated parties, and at the same time, helps clarify the almost overwhelming institutional demands that are placed on generalist courts. So let me just il illustrate briefly how uncertainty and scale together determine whether and how the contract in question deals successfully with the Goldilocks problem. So let's begin with the case of thin markets, where the key variable is going to be the level of uncertainty. For example, think about the battle for evolving technology in the market for electronics. Here the principal actors are few and scattered. That unlike the grain industry, for example, these parties can't rely on a trade association to institutionalize their design solutions. The market is simply too thin. In these circumstances, contract design occurs primarily in one-on-one -on -one bilateral relationships. And here, as I want to show you, the level of uncertainty is going to determine how the parties respond to this problem of shading. So let's start at the bottom where uncertainty is low. For example, let's assume we have a $25 million license agreement for the transfer of clearly specified electronic technology. Uncertainty is low. We know the technology. And here, sophisticated parties can turn to customized, completely specified contracting. By integrating the relevant context into a complete agreement, they can then specify precisely to the court the evidentiary base that is going to be available. For example, the contract itself can provide clear directions to the court of the context within which the contract specifications should be interpreted. How do they do that? Well, you've all seen it. There are a bunch of things. They can include whereas or purpose clauses that explain the party's business plans. They can include definition clauses that ascribe particular meaning to words and terms that vary from their plain meaning. And then most importantly, if you've seen these specified contracts, they contain appendices. And the appendices provide more precise specifications governing performance, as well as any memoranda 
that the parties want the court to consider in interpreting the contract. The point is that writing a completely specified contract dramatically reduces, if not eliminates, the need for the courts to ever inquire into context. By reducing any subsequent factual inquiry, this kind of contract also reduces the likelihood that the court could ever make a mistake in interpreting the contract. And that means it also reduces the incentive for the party who was disfavored by subsequent events, who after all is the likely shader, to engage in opportunistic litigation in the first place. So this is the gold standard. In the setting of a completely specified contract, courts are less mistake prone and parties are less likely to encourage mistakes, resulting in less risk of judicial error. Now, let's suppose uncertainty begins to rise and the parties confront what we might call moderate levels of uncertainty in the sense that now they can identify what should happen in some but not every future state of the world. So for example, what if the product in this case happens to be a new drug and the agent has a license from the owner of the intellectual property and he agrees to secure regulatory approvals and then commercialize the product. Well, this contract, as we all know, will typically charge the agent with using, quote, commercially reasonable or, quote, best efforts to typically accomplish these tasks. And that simply reflects the, fact, reflects the fact that the appropriate strategy is dependent on the outcome of uncertain future events, such as the result of clinical tests, the course of the regulatory process, and competitive conditions in the market, and the like. <coughs> Excuse me. So what happens here? In this intermediate moderate range of uncertainty, what we find is that the parties, or more accurately, their transactional lawyers, combine these broad standards like best efforts with very precise and directive performance obligations. Now we know why they want to use standards, right? Because in this way, the parties can obtain the benefit of hindsight. The court has information at the time of litigation that the parties didn't have at the time of drafting. But we also know that the court's discretion must be confined in order to deter <coughs> subsequent shading behavior. And so here's what they do. They combine the specific terms with the general standards and to do that they can provide precisely the context evidence that the court should see. Now when and to what extent parties use these broad standards depends therefore on how effectively this contract can be designed to reduce the risk that a court can be misled, misled by an opportunistic party to misapply the standard. To reduce these risks, what the contract does is to explicitly identify the context that is relevant. And if you've seen them, they'll tell you what the product is, what the industry is, and what kind of evidence the court should use to interpret the standard. In this way, the best effort standard directs the court to make use of context in addition to text, but limits the court's inquiry to only that context that is relevant. Here again, the lesson is the parties and not the courts choose the balance between text and context that best suits the level of uncertainty the parties are facing. But can the parties still solve the Goldilocks problem when uncertainty gets even higher, when it goes through the roof and challenge the skills of even the best contract designer? And here's where it gets interesting, because at the, as the level of uncertainty rises even higher, commercial parties and their lawyers can no longer rely on traditional forms of contracting. And this is what we've seen over the last 15 years. The challenges of the information revolution 
have led to increasing levels of uncertainty and motivated parties in industries that are affected to innovate by designing entirely new and radical forms of contract. Let's take an example. Electronics is a good example of an affected industry. We know what happens. Electronic firms compete with each other to anticipate and design the next breakthrough in technology. For example, the smartphone uh, phone platform displaces the PC, only to find itself displaced by whatever comes next. This is a high uncertainty environment where an entirely new technology can disrupt the status quo. And it has triggered a revolution in the basic form of the contract. Lawyers, and it is lawyers, we can be proud of ourselves. Lawyers for these parties have innovated by designing novel collaborative agreements that only obligate the parties to explore possibilities without committing them to execute any specific project. In other words, even though here we have again a formal and, ve and very detailed contract of many terms and many pages, the contract regulates only the commitment to collaborate and not the course or the outcome of this collaboration. And that means, if you think about it, any effort to enforce this agreement in court is limited to protecting each party's reliance investment in the collaborative process, rather than directing a division of any surplus that might result if the collaboration succeeds. This limited legal commitment means there's a significant constraint on the potential role of a court charged with policing shading. Any resulting agreement to produce a specified product or purchase a key input, which is, of course, the stuff of contracts, they're not part of the formal contract at all. Rather, the substantive outputs of the collaboration develop only from the informal relationship of mutual trust that is the result of the collaboration process itself. What happens here is really quite remarkable. Lawyers design a contract that builds trust, and then everything after that is governed by the party's trust in each other. And that means that a reviewing court's primary focus will be limited to questions of character rather than capability. The court in these cases asks one single question. Has one party cheated, say by using information gained during the collaboration for its private purposes? Let's turn now and see how scale the thickness of the market changes the landscape of contract design. So let's turn and consider the market for key commodities like grain or cotton. And here we encounter a thick market. <coughs> the costs of design can be spread when the market is thick in the sense that many actors face similar risks and they stand to benefit from concerted responses. What happens in this environment is that the parties can institutionalize their contract design through the collective action of industry associations. Once again, the design challenge will vary depending on the level of uncertainty. But scaling the contractual product permits novel responses to the Goldilocks problem. So let me just quickly tell you how this works. Notice how scale can change the party's design responses even in low uncertainty settings. So let's assume we're in a particular industry where the practices are very stable, everybody knows them, well understood by the community of traders. Nevertheless, a generalist judge can't be expected to have knowledge of these embedded trade practices or be able to conveniently obtain the information needed to make an accurate determination of which party is the shader. 
So the trade association has to cope with judicial ignorance, while at the same time create a framework that reduces the risk of shading. What happens? Well, this motivates the trade association to engage in innovative design. And the result is this. These trade groups have chosen to rely on expert arbitrators to strictly enforce industry-approved, standardized contract terms. They regularly update the terms to keep them current with practice as it evolves. And in this way, the trade group enlists the third-party decision-maker with a very limited charge. Just monitor the shading risk by holding the parties to the strict terms of the contract. That's the only question. But you say, well, wait a minute. What about context? What about the party-to-party -party adjustments that are always necessary as change conditions affect performance? And here, in these trade association contractual relationships, that is left entirely to the relational norms of reciprocity, tit-for-tat, and the discipline of repeated dealings. And as a consequence, the risk of parties making a strategic argument about what is the, quote, true agreement is entirely eliminated. Finally then, what happens in a thick market when uncertainty increases and the parties now need once again to rely on these standards to harness the hindsight advantages of a court? Well, this is the good news for courts because under certain circumstances, if you have the necessary scale, parties can use their scale to invest a particular court with expertise in uncovering the relevant market. For example, as we most know, intimate familiarity with the evolving commercial practice can permit an expert court like the Delaware Court of Chancery to reliably recover the always involving, evolving contextual facts needed to resolve fiduciary duty disputes. So the courts in these areas of geographic concentration of similar contracting parties can, over time, develop both judicial expertise in the subject matter and a body of precedents that can parallel what the private regimes do with trade associations. <laughs> In effect, in instances such as the Delaware Court of Chancery or perhaps the Santa Clara County Superior Court with respect to the Silicon Valley Industrial District, we see a contracting regime that reflects the potential that generalist courts may become specialist courts through repeated exposure to a particular industry. And under these circumstances, a court can develop the expertise to police shading effectively and thus help parties in their quest to solve the Goldilocks problem. These examples are only illustrative of the many variations in contract design where transactional lawyers today have relied on both experience and intuition to innovate. The central idea that I want to share is that the level of uncertainty the thickness of the relevant market will determine the range of design strategies that are found in contemporary commercial transactions. This relationship between uncertainty, scale, and the form of the contract vividly illustrates the problem confronting generalist courts in assessing how to cope with the risks of opportunistic behavior because the role of the generalist court will differ across the various dimensions that I have outlined. But in all events, as we've seen, it will be much more restricted than the standard account under which a court is supposed to fit innovative forms of contracting into the traditional categories of common law contract doctrine. If a central goal of contract adjudication is to enforce the contract in the context that the parties have provided, then the courts need to defer to the context that the parties have given them. To do that, both judges and contract theorists will have to attend to the 
unique characteristics of the novel contracts currently being designed by transactional lawyers. Thus, in this environment, courts must practice the passive virtues because it is the parties, not the courts, that drive the innovation in contract design. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have time for a number of questions. So if you want to raise your hand, and I will recognize you, and we will go from there. Yes, Judge Clavert, if you could press the rim of that microphone, not the top, the rim, and hold it down. It may work. If not, we'll be able to hear and repeat it. I absolutely believe in forum selection clauses. But, you know, look, I'm an I'm a autonomy kind of guy. I, uh, I believe that commercial parties get to decide how to make contracts that uh, as long as they are legally sophisticated parties represented by good counsel, they should have the right to choose the environment that they want, and they ought to have the right to choose the forum that they want. So I'm a big fan of forum selection clauses when it comes to the class of contracts we're talking about. One of my big pet peeves is that we confuse the ability of sophisticated, legally sophisticated parties to design their own contractual relationships and have that relationship enforced from an entirely separate problem, which has really little to do with contract law and is about regulation, and that is the rights of consumers or legally unsophisticated parties to be able to make sure that they're, they are not exploited in the process. But I want to make that separation, and with respect to legally sophisticated parties, I do want to argue uh, for their free freedom to make the choices that, that they think best. Thank you. Other questions? Yes. Yeah, here in uh, Milwaukee a while back, we, uh, we tried to have a specialist court for commercial disputes, and nobody used it. And I was wondering if you're aware of uh, other parts of the country where they've done that and people actually did use the courts. Well, we have one in New York. We have a commercial court now in New York, um, which is quite uh, heavily used. Now, you know, New York, has, I mean, particularly in New York City, we're pretty parochial folks, and we think that the world ends at the Hudson River. Um, but the New York legislature has worked very hard to create um, a, a market so that New York lawyers can prosper. Uh, one of the, uh, it's true. There's a statute in New York. There's a statute in New York that says if the amount in controversy is over $250,000, anybody, any two parties, can choose New York courts and New York law without any contacts or anything else, right? So by inviting people to come in, maybe the, the, the end result is, and we'll create a commercial court, and, and you know, it's kind of like Kevin Costner. If you build it, they will come. Uh, but it's certainly working in New York. That happened in Wisconsin, and the Wisconsin courts would call that uh, uh, unlawful. <laughs> that statute would be subject to the reach or the constraints of the due process clause as a civil procedure professor. I feel <laughs> the obligation to point out. Other questions for Professor Scott? Yes, please. Uh, in Bob, in, is the use of arbitration limited to this one category where you mentioned it, where the trade associations and stuff? Well, or this is Professor Bill Whitford from the University of Wisconsin at Madison, an old mm -hmm. friend of mine. Um, and, and because I recognize you, Bill, I didn't get the question, so you're going to have to. <laughs> He's been lying in wait for you to come to Milwaukee so he could ask you this question. It has to do with just again. the use of arbitration. Yeah. And I'm wondering if it's limited to the uh, trade, the kind of uh, thick market yeah. kind of uh, where the trade association right. stuff. Right. Yes. Or Actually, where do you find the use of arbitration in your thin market? It is, to some extent, uh, in the, in, uh, although it is not as ubiquitous, in the um, collaborative contract regimes we've studied, um, particularly in the pharmaceutical industry where there's a lot of these collaborations, big pharma, little biotech get together and collaborate, the, um, 
they do they do specify arbitration as the decision making not not universally but it's but it's pretty commonly commonly done but it is it is it is not ubiquitous it's common but not not ubiquitous in the trade association studies it's almost universal i get a follow up please yeah you can a follow up question is this do you find any correlation between the degree of drafting that goes in in an effort to kind of control the decision maker respect to context? Uh, any correlation between whether or not arbitration has arbitration has specified? Oh, that's an excellent question, uh, Bill. Would be if there's arbitration, yeah. there would be. Yeah, yeah. It, it, the question is whether or not there is, and what we've looked at, any correlation between um, the degree to which the contract has been drafted in a way that combines general standards with precise terms in order to build the context into the standard and the choice of arbitration. And um, I'm embarrassed to say I, I haven't asked that question of myself, so I don't know the answer, but it's a terrific question, and we do have the data to try to find it out. And I, and I will. It's a great question. We have time for a couple more questions. <clears throat> yes, Nadell. Professor Grossman. <laughs> Either will work. Um, that was a great presentation. I'm curious if you would view as a separate factor if you're looking at the thinness of the markets, the uncertainty, but also the uh, bargaining position of the parties. Because I think like in certain types of transactions, you might have like a thick market, repeat players, like a borrower lender, but lender is almost always in the superior bargaining position. And so you see sort of vague standards no matter what, even though they could yeah. I, I'm just curious if that would be. Yeah. Strategy. No, I, I left out a couple of the difficult questions, <laughs> and that certainly is one. Um, as as you may know, uh, another area I study, which is an area far removed from the one we're talking about, is uh, sovereign bond contracting, and and there it's one sided in a somewhat different way. The issuer basically decides the the terms and isn't negotiating with anyone. Uh, and, and the interesting thing there is that terms don't change, even though the circumstances would seem to require the change. Some of you heard about the Argentina litigation that's roiling the uh, sovereign debt markets. Um, so uh, there's no question that, um, that, that, if the, that if the deal has not been negotiated between legally sophisticated parties, you're going to get um, you're going to get differences in terms of the nature of the terms that are distributional as opposed to surplus enhancing, where one party is prepared to deal with or accept a contract that isn't as designed as effectively as you want because they think they're going to get an, an advantage. It's like building a house that, uh, where you know, my room is twice as big as yours, even though that makes the house ugly because I get the bigger room. I mean, it, it, you, you are right. Those distributional concerns exist even in sophisticated transactions. So my effort to divide the world between legally sophisticated and, and legally unsophisticated is a useful um, heuristic, but you would be correct to say that there are lots of transactions that don't fit beautifully that way. I think we have time for one more question. No one wants to accept that august responsibility. So let me say several things. First, thank you to all of you for being here for this year's Robert F. Bowden Lecture. I'm really grateful that you would spend some time with us here in Marquette University Law School. Second, please know that we will have a reception in the Zilber Forum right outside the appellate courtroom. And so for the hardball question that you were just too decent, Professor Whitford or Professor Desai from the University of Wisconsin, to uh, ask Professor Scott uh, in the room. Uh, you can buttonhole him uh, individually. And third, uh, without doubt, most importantly, thank you to Bob Scott for really an especially engaging voting. Thank you. Thank you.